Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Gary, and I don't have Jeff here with me today, but I wanted to talk about loving one another, especially as we see the day approaching. So hat tip to Brother Barry Scarborough. He really inspired me with his recent video called You Are Not a Failure. And it was such a good and timely message for a lot of us and also for 11th hour workers. So I want to talk about that. And I also wanted to touch on the 24 elders again, because it really is a very important topic. I wanted to cover a few more verses on the subject. And you don't have to believe or understand the 24 elders to be the church, to hold to a pre-tribulational view of the rapture. But if you do understand the 24 elders to be the church, to represent the glorified church in heaven after the resurrection and rapture event, then the argument is over before it began because the 24 elders are enthroned in heaven before any of the 21 judgments of Revelation play out. Whether they be the seals or the trumpets or the vials of wrath makes no difference. The elders are there before the lamb even begins to unseal the scroll. So I wanted to talk about that again. And then I wanted to touch on two arguments that are often used to defend a post-tribulation view of the rapture uh, or even to critique the, the pre-tribulational view of the timing and why I don't think these arguments really hold up to scrutiny. Also, before I begin, I really just want to share a word about imminency. I think this is really important because I don't think people are being taught clearly on the doctrine of imminency and what the doctrine of imminency means in terms of scripture and looking for the rapture. And I think because there's a lack of clarity on this topic, it's causing some to even scoff at the rapture and not to watch at all. So it's sort of commonly being taught in the, the pre-trib camp that the Lord could come at any moment. And I believe that that's misleading and it's actually causing some not to watch and actually not to be awake to how close we are. And there's a certain danger in that. There's a fear that by talking about high watch days or even speculating about the timing at all, that, you know, it, it opens up the church to, to mockery even when dates come and go. And of course, there's wisdom in being cautious and being careful. And those that are out there saying, thus saith the Lord, he's coming back on, you know, 1221 at 4 p.m. Uh, that's just foolishness. Like there's no doubt that's foolishness. But watching is more than just being alive and breathing and being aware that Jesus is going to come again. Watching is something that goes beyond that. Watching is it's being awake and aware of what Scripture says in terms of the signs that will precede his arrival, that will precede his coming. It's being awake to the times. So this the same thing is something Jesus addressed at his first coming. You know how to discern the face of the sky when it's red. You know, you say, okay, a storm's coming, but yet you can't discern the signs of the times. It's almost as if he's saying the signs prophetically of his first arrival were clearer even than a red sky. So the signs of his second coming are that much clearer. If you think about history in terms of technology and culture and society, we live at this very peculiar time, basically a, a 100, 150 year period of time where we have air travel, space travel, uh, cars, electricity, <laughs> and, you know, all kinds of technology, air conditioning. We have smartphones and computers and nuclear weapons, and you go on and on and on. There's so much technology, and it's really just in the last couple of generations that all this stuff has come out of nowhere and it, it's prefaced the time the time period that we're in because in order to get to a worldwide government in a worldwide apostate religious system and technology for the implementation of a worldwide economic system via the mark of the beast you need these things to be in place and here they are it's just one small glimpse into a sign of the time that people should be awake to and aware of and realize, okay, well, this, this scenario, this stage is unique to this time in history 
and it wasn't here 1,000 years ago. I think it's misleading when people say that Jesus could come at any time because that implies his coming is random and his coming is not random. So there's a particular judgment in Revelation that says it was prepared for the very year and week and day and hour. And that was written 2,000 years ago, almost, you know, when John received the message and inscribed it on, transcribed it on the scroll. So if that one particular judgment was that precise, this, the setting of it, the timing of it was that precise, how much more so the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ and all the other events. So Jesus coming, it's not a random thing. And that's misleading to say that it is. And that's misleading to say that's what imminency means. The word imminence really means more to overhang or to be over top of. In other words, it's right on top of you. This event is right before your face. It's at hand. That's what imminence means. Imminence has nothing to do with randomness or any moment, because any moment could be just as applicable 1,000 years ago as it is to 1,000 years in the future. And so a lot of Christians don't watch and are not awake to the times and are not putting the pieces together in terms of coronavirus and peace deals in the Middle East and the march toward a one world system and the third temple and all these things that are coming together right now. They're not awake to it because in their view, well, Jesus could come at any random moment in history. So the chance he's coming in my lifetime is pretty slim, maybe when I'm an old person or something. And then on the other hand, you know, to further that you hear, well, no man knows the day or the hour, which is taken from Jesus, all of that discourse where he said, no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels, not even the son, but only the father. So there's two really glaring problems with how that verse is used to silence any discussion of prophecy as being relevant to right now. The first is that Jesus' words were perfect tense in every instance. And that, that quote from Jesus is cited several different times in scripture, but it's always perfect tense. And perfect tense is something that was true in the past and true with consequences up to the present when it was spoken. But it's not future tense and it's not present tense. So it's not necessarily an ongoing thing. And it's not something that will necessarily be true in the future. But it was true in the past up to the point where Jesus was speaking. That's what perfect tense means. Something that was completed with ongoing effects up to when, in this case, when Jesus spoke. So literally, it's no one has known the day or the hour. It's not no one knows. It's no one has known. That's what it says. That's the literal translation. I think that's a, a really important distinction to make. And then the second thing is that in that same passage of scripture, Jesus tells a parable of a wicked servant who thinks to himself, my master delayeth his coming. So he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. And then his Lord comes on a day, it says a day he does not know, <laughs> a day in an hour, he does, you know, a day in an hour he does not know. So there's a message in that very passage of scripture in the same all of a discourse where it's the wicked servant who's not awake to the time. He doesn't know the day and the hour. So does that mean that we will know the day and the hour of the Lord's coming with certainty? I don't think so. I don't think that's what that means. I think there is going to be some ambiguity and some guesswork involved and i think we have to go about it with humility and a lot of people have not gone about it with humility they've gone way ahead of themselves and they've made declarations as if the lord spoke it and that's a honestly a foolish thing to do and that has caused harm but when we say look at this you know this this makes a lot of sense this particular day or this particular week or this season everything's converged that's not foolish. That's not anti-scriptural. That's just that's just common sense. When you take scripture literally, he gave all these signs. He said what was going to preface his return, his appearing. We should be awake to that. And it's important to understand that we can sometimes be so focused on one particular minor doctrine. In this case, whether or not we can know the day or the hour of the Lord's appearing 
we can be so narrowly focused on that that we end up contradicting much more important truths of scripture. For instance, well, people will say, well, Jesus does not know the day or the hour because he, he said he doesn't know the day or the hour. Well, if you believe that Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour still, then you're starting to contradict more important doctrines such as the glorification of Christ, the deity of Christ, the omniscience of Christ. He is fully God. He's not partially God. He's fully God. And he does know now. He does know now. So Paul wrote to the Philippians that uh, he emptied himself. He humbled himself to become a servant. So the reason he didn't know when he spoke those words in the Olivet Discourse, the reason he didn't know up to that point, the day or the hour, was because he had willingly humbled himself to be a servant, to uh, take on flesh, to be restricted by what it means to be a man so that he could live the life that we can't live and so that he could die the death that we deserve and then rise again. So you better believe he knows now. Uh, he does. He's, the, he's deity. As Ephesians said, you know, when he ascended on high, then you know, he, he filled everything. He is fully God. He was fully God as a man, but he restrained himself. And now he's ascended on high and is glorified and is no longer restraining himself in that sense. Like he has filled all things. He's, he's experiencing what it means to be omnipresent, to be omniscient. His father revealed more to him, revealed the rest of the picture, and he's delivered that to the church. That's what the book of Revelation really is. It opens with a revelation of Jesus Christ that he gave, and he had John transcribe it to show his servants what things must quickly come to pass. And, and that's what Revelation repeatedly says, not that Jesus is going to come at any moment randomly, but that Jesus is coming quickly and his coming is at hand. That's what it says. That's what scripture says. It doesn't talk about a random coming, not prefaced by signs or anything like that. That's not scriptural. It's he's coming quickly and his coming is near. That's true. And revelation was given to reveal the, the rest of the picture so that we, would, we wouldn't be left in the dark. Whereas in the book of Daniel, the angel Gabriel told Daniel to seal up the scroll until the time of the end. In other words, prophetic knowledge would be hidden in the Revelation era, in the period of the church, we read in Revelation 22, don't seal the words of the scroll because the time is at hand. We are now in the church age, the era where the time of the Lord's coming is now truly at hand from God's perspective, not from necessarily the human perspective. A lot of us are like, well, it's 2000 years. That doesn't seem like his coming is really truly imminent, but God says it's imminent and it is imminent from his perspective. And so if you think about the church age, uh, you know, it's 2000 years. If you think of it in terms of all of history, it's just a couple of days. So if you subscribe to the dates given in the Masoretic text of the Old Testament, that's what is found in most Old Testaments that are printed today, then the earth is about 6,000 years old. And in Second Peter 3, we hear that to the Lord, a thousand years are just like a day. And that comes from actually Psalm chapter 90. So if the world was created on Sunday, so to speak, then we're, you know, the church age began on, on Thursday toward the end of the week. So from a big picture, an overview picture of history, we are in the last days and his coming, Lord's coming for the church is imminent in that sense. And the Lord's coming is also imminent to all Christians from all generations in that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So for any Christian, regardless of when they were born in, in period of the church age, they would see the Lord Jesus in no more than a century or even, you know, in most cases, much less than that, maybe 30, 40, 50 years from when they came to faith. So the Lord's coming is imminent in several different ways. And we know that even though some, some groups like Seventh-day Adventists teach that there's basically no consciousness after death, 
we know that's not a scriptural view because again, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know the Lord's parable about the rich man and Lazarus where after death, the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham, they were all very conscious and very awake and very aware. They were in Hades and Lazarus and Abraham were in a peaceful sort of paradise section of the realm of the dead. And the rich man was in torment in the realm of the dead, but they were all conscious. They were aware. And then we also know from the book of Revelation that disembodied spirits also have some form and some awareness. So the disembodied spirits of the tribulation saints are gathered under the heavenly altar, as is described in Revelation chapter 6 with the fifth seal. So that's, that's one example. There are other examples in scripture, but Christians are never more than one lifetime away from seeing the Lord Jesus. That's important. So in a lot of different ways, we can reconcile the New Testament scriptures that talk about the Lord's coming is at hand with, when we understand those things. But we can't reconcile the New Testament scriptures with sort of a modern invention that imminency means that the Lord's coming is random and could really happen at any moment. It's not going to happen at any moment. It's going to happen at the very moment the Lord determines and has already determined since before the creation of the world, because he is sovereign. He's already planned everything out. Acts 17. So that's important. I just wanted to kind of clear that up because I think we need to we need to be careful that we teach that correctly so that our brothers and sisters are awake to the times and are not closed off to it with sort of these, these cliche things we hear. That well, no one knows the day or the hour, so why watch? Why think about it? And he could come at any time, so you know, it's just as likely a thousand years from now than it is today. That's not the sense of scripture. That's not what we want people to understand. We want people to know he is about to rend the heavens and come down and take us out of here. And you better be ready because it is going to happen very, very soon, and it will leave this world changed in a way you know, beyond anything we can imagine. And if you are not ready, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you will be left behind and you will suffer incredible torment. It's not something to be playing with. God is not a God to be trifled with. He really is coming very soon. So it's sobering when you think about it. And as uh, Jeff mentioned last week, it's bittersweet. We're going home, but it's bittersweet in the sense that there are people that we love and care about who are not going with us. So I have observed, and I think others have observed this as well, like J.D. Frag, that internet Christianity doesn't really function the same way as the local body of believers. When they gather together corporately in church, there's a certain way that you, you talk to one another, you respect one another. And that, that same sense of community and fellowship doesn't always exist online. A lot of times internet Christianity is just beating each other over the head, so to speak, with scripture and verses. And it's almost like a constant cacophony of noise and quarrel. And it's the very thing that Paul wrote against, you know, don't quarrel with one another. Don't do that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about you know, loving one another. And for a lot of people, those that they know online or through group me or Marco Polo or digitally, that's the only Christian community that they have. And that's, you know, we, we live in a year where that's, that's kind of a reality for a lot of people as they can't meet with people that much outside of their home. And so they still need community and they still need fellowship. And as Proverbs 18 says that the one who isolates himself fights against all all reason all, all all sound wisdom he he's a quarrelsome person and so it's important that we not isolate ourselves we're not actually on an island we are a body we're the mystical body of Christ and we're not all an ear and we're not all a nose and we're not all feet and we don't really always believe this, but we actually do need one another. And if we don't have one another, we end up going way off into the weeds because we have no authority over us. And there are those that claim that their only authority is Christ, but 
the way that they are living and the way that they are treating other people shows that that is not their authority. And part of that is that Christ commanded us to be mutually submissive. So, you know, you've, you've heard the scripture that, you know, wives submit to your husbands, but husbands should submit to their wives in the sense that we become a servant leader who will love our wives as Christ loved the church. So Christianity is about mutual submission. Christ, the Lord of all, the creator of all, who made all things, who's before all things, he himself submitted to people on earth. When he got down on their level and he healed them, when he washed the disciples' feet, when he submitted to the authority of the Romans and the Jewish leaders who had him put to death, the son of the living God, with an army of angels at his command, submitted. And if the Lord can submit, then who are we as disciples of the Lord, as servants and slaves of the Lord, to say that we can't submit? We have no authority over us. No one can tell us what to do. That's not scriptural. That's not, you know, read, read the books of First and Second Timothy. Read what Paul wrote. And not just Paul, but the church is a group that submits mutually to one another. And that doesn't mean some sort of legalistic hierarchy where there's a tyrant at the top. That's not what that means at all. But it means we act as one another's servants to love one another and to think of others as better than ourselves, higher than ourselves, in a sense, because we've been freed from our sins in his blood. We, by our own volition, by our own free will, choose to be the slave of one another. And it's a way of thinking that is is very different from what the world says and what the world looks like and even what most of Christianity looks like. But that's what the scriptural view is. And so, yeah, I just wanted to just, just talk about that because there are important issues and a lot of debates do center around what are important issues, but yet we're still committed not to quarrel. We can talk even with someone that disagrees with us about something that's essential, like who is God and who is Jesus? We can still talk to them lovingly. We can still be winsome with our words. You will never persuade someone by beating them over the head, but you will persuade someone with how you treat them, with how you love them, with how you serve them. And that's, that's so important. So I think we can do that as Christians too. You know, we're, we're quarreling sometimes over extremely minor things like, even the flavor of dispensationalism that we subscribe to, or we may agree on the gospel. We may agree on sola fide, but we disagree as to the timing of the rapture. It's, it is important. Don't get me wrong, but it's not an essential thing. And it's not how one is born again. And it's not how one is prepared for the rapture. We are prepared for the rapture by the all sufficient blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which watches, washes us whiter than snow. And there's no other preparation than that. So, we should love one another. We should be kind, kind with our words, gentle with our words. We can persuade a lot of people to the gospel by being kind and being loving. And that's what Jesus said. They will know you are my disciples because of your love for one another. So here in John 15, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture. Jesus says, this is my command that you love one another according as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that anyone may lay down his life for his friends. And by the way, I'm reading from the LSV. So if you're wondering, and there's a lot of ways you can you can get the LSV, access it. So the American Bible Society app has the LSV. And then ebible.org actually has an interlinear version, which is pretty cool. But I'm reading from the American uh, Bible Society app. You are my friends if you may do whatever I command you. I no longer call you servants. So Jesus, the son of God, is telling his disciples, you aren't just my slaves. You aren't just these below me who serve and do my bidding. No, because the servant has not known what his Lord does. And I have called you friends because all things that I heard from my father, I made known to you. Jesus treats us like brothers. In a way, he treats us higher than himself because he submitted to us through his death. You did not choose me, but I chose you 
and appointed you that you might go away and might bear fruit and your fruit might remain that whatever you may ask of the father in my name, he may give you these things. I command you that you love one another. And then John 17, and then keep in mind, this is coming seemingly, at least in the narrative of John, right after the John 14 passage, where Jesus declares that he is the way and the truth and the life. And I talked about that as a very key promise and an important pre-tribulational proof and promise where he's going to come and take us to be with him in his father's house. He's taken us out of the world to go and be with him in the rooms prepared for us. Now, some have said, well, that's figurative in some sense. That's that's an allegorical thing. It doesn't mean we're actually going to be taken out of the world, taken to heaven. But John 17 really makes clear that it is. So Jesus is praying to the Father. This is seemingly not long before his death. And he, he prays, I ask in regard to them, the disciples. I do not ask in regard to the world, but in regard to those whom you have given to me, because they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And get this, Jesus says, and I am no longer in the world, and these are in the world, and I come to you. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I'm going out of this world to you, Father, but they are still going to be in the world. Holy Father, keep them in your name, whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are one. When I was with them in the world, I was keeping them in your name. I guarded those whom you have given to me. And none of them were destroyed, except the son of destruction. So speaking of Judas, that the writing may be fulfilled. And now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given your word to them, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you may take them out of the world, but that you may keep them out of the evil. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in, the, in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And I sanctify myself for them, that they also may be sanctified in truth themselves. And then finally, and I do not ask in regard to these alone, but also in regard to those who will be believing in me through their word that they all may be one as you father are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus has this desperate prayer before he's about to be killed as our propitiation and rise again and then leave the world, go to the father. He's making it very clear that he's in the world. He's saying these things in the world. And he even emphasizes he's saying these things to be of benefit to us probably even in the prophetic sense that he knew that his words would be transcribed as he says, you know, not just for these, but for those that would believe in me through their message that he knew that his words were going to ring throughout the age and be of benefit to us. But he's going to the father, he's leaving the world and his disciples were not going to leave the world yet, but that he would come again as John 14 says and take us out. So he's making it clear. He's not, it's not allegorical that the disciples are still in the world he's leaving the world he's going to the father and then he will eventually come back again and take us to himself so it is a pre-tribulational promise and he speaks here of his desire to see his disciples be one as he is one with the father this builds on this idea of love he wants us to love one another to be one to be unified so that the world will know that we are his disciples. And when we're not unified, the world doesn't know. That's the standard for how the world will know you're a Christian is by your love. It's not by anything else, but by your love. So the foundation is Christ and our faith in his blood. But on top of that, if you want to build anything on top of that foundation that's going to last, then you have to have love for one another. And that's so important. And his desperate plea was, can you be one? So can we honor his prayer? You know, can we be one? Especially since we're so close. So this shows up in how we talk to one another, how we handle an offense, how we, you know, disagree 
agreeably. And when we are sharing the gospel or debating some topic, you know, how, how do we go about that? So that's so important. I just wanted to touch on that. I think that's really important. And to finish that off is one of my favorite passages of scripture in uh, John's first epistle, where he writes, Beloved, may we love one another because love is of God and everyone loving has been begotten of God and knows God. He who is not loving did not know God because God is love. In this was revealed the love of God in us because God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So God is love. So when I think through the inventory of scripture, I can think of only two things <laughs> are, are two attributes, so to speak, that aren't just applied to God, but are said to actually be God in some sense. That is love and that is light. It says that God is light. And here in First John, it says that God is love. And that's important. This attribute is so central to his nature and his character. It's more central than his wrath or his anger. And in a sense, it's his most central, most important attribute is that God is love. And we know that from his, his nature as three persons in one being. He's not a solitary, isolated, unitarian entity, but he's one being in three persons. He's a community in and of himself, into himself. God is love. And the Father eternally loves the Son. And from their love eternally proceeds the Holy Spirit. It's so important to understand God is love. And so we, as bearers of his image, reflect that. You know, that's what we're supposed to do, especially now that he's, the Lord Jesus is about to be taking us home. Let's let our final legacy be obedience to the prayer that he prayed shortly before his death. Switching gears again, I wanted to talk about those of you that maybe came to faith more recently. And um, maybe it was this year, you know, with coronavirus and everything. It's definitely been a very eye-opening year. And this is something that I think Barry's recent video was so good. There are 11th hour workers. You know, you, you didn't necessarily know the gospel. You weren't on board until recently. I mean, maybe it was today. Maybe you came to faith today. Maybe you even came to faith during the first segment of this video, for all I know. And there might be part of you saying, well, what, what can I offer? What legacy can I leave? And I just want to say you can. You are not judged in comparison to another disciple who's been walking with the Lord much longer. That's not how the Lord rewards. And Jesus tells a parable that explains this. This is so important because I think if you understand the grace of God, how fully accepted and loved and covered in his blood you are now through faith, you will be more productive, very productive in the last few, maybe even days that we have left. So listen to this from Matthew 20. Jesus said, for the kingdom of the heavens is like to a man, a householder, who went forth with the morning to hire workmen for his vineyard. And having agreed with the workmen for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And having gone forth about the third hour, he saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And to these he said, go also you to the vineyard and whatever may be righteous, I will give you. And they went away again having gone forth about the sixth and the ninth hour, he did in like manner. And about the eleventh hour, having gone forth, he found others standing idle and says to them, why have you stood here idle all day? And they say to him, because no one hired us. He says to them, go, you also to the vineyard and whatever may be righteous, you will receive. And evening having come, the Lord of the vineyard says to his steward, Call the workmen and pay the reward, having begun from the last <laughs> to the first. And they of about the eleventh hour having come, each received a denarius. 
and the first having come, supposed that they will receive more, and they received, they also each a denarius. And having received it, they were murmuring against the householders, saying that these last worked one hour, and you made them equal to us who were bearing the burden of the day and the heat. And he answering said to them, friend, I do no unrighteousness to you. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take that which is yours and go. And I will, and I, and I will to give to this the last also as to you. Is it not lawful to me to do what I will in my own? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last for many are called and few chosen. You know, this parable has a lot of application, I think, in a very direct sense. It has application in terms of, you know, the disciples who are with Jesus. And a lot of them were, you know, former prostitutes and kind of the lowest of the low the B team, maybe the C team, the fishermen, you know, just the, the grunts, the blue collar workers, so to speak. And Jesus called these who were last in society and the first in society were, well, the big picture is they were trying to establish their own righteousness. And so they weren't getting in the door. But I think we also see, you know, this application to the church age where there's a lot of people that have dedicated their life to serving the Lord and they've accomplished a lot for the kingdom. And then there's people that are just coming in the door right now, <laughs> right before the flood's about to hit and the door to the ark is about to close. And there can be this kind of inner, not really jealousy, but maybe frustration is, looking down on these people that are just coming in, but that's not the Lord's heart at all. He's, he's giving a promise and hope to those who didn't know the, the, the joy and the love and the hope that we have now through Christ. Those that come in at the very last moment, you get a denarius too. So your, your job, your command from the Lord, not for salvation, because your salvation is secure in him, your command for the Lord is just to be faithful with what God is giving you right now with the time that you have left. And you may not have been given as much because you don't have as much time left, or maybe it doesn't seem like you have as much opportunity left, but you should not compare yourself to those that have come before, you know, the heroes of the faith that have come in ages past, a preacher now that has cast a net and is reeling in a ton of fish. Your job is just to be faithful with what God's giving you now, and he will reward you greatly based on how faithful you are with what you have left. So one of my favorite examples of this is Stephen, the martyr Stephen. He really doesn't play a very seemingly big role in scripture. His account is recorded in the book of Acts, and he attended a synagogue called the, the synagogue of the, the free men. And he has this one moment, this one moment where he's filled with the spirit. He shares the gospel with everybody there. It's just one moment. And immediately he's killed immediately. That's, that's it. There's no more Stephen in the new Testament. And then you have Paul who wrote a huge chunk of the new Testament and went all over the Mediterranean Spent his life sharing the gospel, establishing churches, you know, pouring his soul out as a living sacrifice on the altar of the Lord, in a sense. And and so, you know, we see a lot more of his story. But when it's all said and done, you know, you look back at the, the story of Stephen. Who knows what the impact of Stephen's martyrdom was to the early church? And Paul was there. Paul was in, in attendance when Stephen was stoned to death. So what the impact was on Paul himself from Stephen's one speech, his, his one, you know, record of sharing the gospel. Um, it's huge. He had had one moment and Stephen was faithful with what God gave him. And, you know, look at the impact. And Stephen didn't get to see any of the fruit. You know, Paul got to see a lot of the fruit of what he did. 
because he could see a lot of his the churches that he established that were flourishing and they, they were planting other churches too and the gospel was going forth he could see that fruit and that was a blessing that god gave him to see it even while he was still alive stephen didn't get to see anything and he just got to see stones coming at him but when it's all said and done you know, he saw the Son of Man standing up to receive him into glory. But that's so important is there are people that kind of stand out because that's the role God gave them. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be rewarded more. It just means that that's the particular place God has put them. There are preachers that stand up and share the gospel with 10,000 people. Then there are people in a more servile role that maybe shared the gospel with one person who ends up being a preacher that shares it with 10,000. You know, it, you, you have no way of knowing how the Lord is going to use you, but you will be richly rewarded if you would just be faithful with what God gives you. And you're not measured against the Billy Grahams and the Franklin Grahams and the famous missionaries and stuff through history. You're, you're measured against yourself. You're measured against what God's given you. So that's it's just an important thing. And I hope that encourages you to think about because there are a lot of 11th hour workers right now and the flood is about to hit. And so if you've recently come to faith, you are very lucky because you, you just made it by the skin of your teeth in terms of timing. But you can still be richly rewarded. You can still build on the foundation of Christ with costly stones and gems and gold and silver things that will last and withstand the fire so anyway just just take heart in that all right and just to wrap this video up i wanted to talk about the 24 elders one more time and kind of going over some of the same material i covered before but i wanted to show you some of the scriptures so identifying the 24 elders as the church is a very clear connection and i think it's actually a direct connection you can make when you understand the bigger picture, the narrative picture of Revelation. So especially the letters to the churches, Revelation 2 and 3, and then in Revelation 4 and 5, the throne room scene. I think it's easy to muddy the waters when you pick apart the verses, the scriptures, or read them in isolation. Like when you read Revelation chapter 4 and 5 in isolation from the letters of Revelation 2 and 3, it might be easier to not make the connection that the 24 elders are the church, but that's not how that's not how narrative is written. That's not how the book of Revelation is written. The book of Revelation has themes that connect throughout, and um, we shouldn't lose sight of that. So just kind of keep that in mind. In Revelation 2 and 3, there are the letters to the seven churches. All right, so to the church of Smyrna, Jesus writes, through John, do not be afraid of the things that you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you will have tribulation ten days. Become faithful to death, and I will give to you the garland of life. So uh, most translations have crown here, a crown of life. The Greek is actually Stephanos, which is literally a garland or a wreath rather than a kingly crown. But this is a promise to the church, it is a garland. And then in chapter 3, Jesus makes this promise to Sardis. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who did not defile their garments, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. The one thus overcoming, and remember that John himself defines overcoming for us. So anybody that says overcoming means having enough works, performing well, doing good enough, they are not being faithful to, to the scripture because John defines it as believing in the Son of God. That is what overcoming means. And that's what makes us, the body of believers, unique, is that we do believe in the Son of God. And as is also written, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We've overcome the world through faith in the Son. So that's how we overcome. Just to be really clear, this word in the Greek Nikaio, that's used throughout the letters to the churches about overcome, overcome, overcome. It's important to understand that because the definition isn't provided within 
the letters to the churches, but it is provided in John's epistle. But the church of Sardis, they're promised white garments. And Jesus says, I will not blot out his name from the scroll of life. That's important, too, is that a lot of Christians say, oh, if you don't do well, then Jesus will blot your name out. But that's not what it says. They actually take a promise and then they twist it. It's not a threat. It's a promise. If you overcome, Jesus says, I will not, I will not blot your name out of the scroll of life. You have overcome through faith, and so your name will remain in the scroll of life no matter what. As Jesus said in John, no one can snatch them out of my hand, no, nothing. And what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, nothing, not, not even ourselves, because we've been born again. You can't be unborn, and you can't be blotted out because you've been born from above. So that's really important to understand that that concept of nakao overcome or to conquer that's really important so we saw that the church is promised a garland and here we see that the church is promised white garments okay and then going down a little bit further to the church of laodicea jesus says i counsel you to buy from me gold fired by fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed. So take the free gift. That's what he's saying to Laodicea. He stands at the door and he knocks. People say, oh, the Laodiceans, they were believers who fell away. But I argue they were, they're not believers to begin with. Maybe the church started out with believers but whatever the current crop is, they don't have faith in the Son of God. They have faith in themselves. And this is what Jesus counsels them is to become aware of their hopeless state, that they are naked and poor and blind and needy. He uses all these, these words to describe how hopeless they are, that they're miserable, they're wretched. Because they need Jesus and they don't realize that. They think that they're sufficient in themselves. That's why they're lukewarm. They don't know the Lord. He's outside. He's not inside the church of Laodicea. He's outside and he's knocking. Let me in. Let me in. And if they would let him in, then they would become part of his body and they would get these things promised to them. So Jesus closes the letters to the churches with this saying, he who is overcoming, I will give to him to sit with me in my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. What an incredible promise. And you can't really get a higher promise than that. So the throne represents kingly power and authority. And in Revelation 2, those that overcome are also promised to rule over the nations with a rod of iron, the same authority and rod of iron promised to Christ in Psalm chapter two. And this is reemphasizing that, that we will have authority. The church will have authority ruling on thrones. So the church has promised white garments. The church has promised never to be blotted out from the book of life. The church has promised gold. If they would take it, the church has promised garlands. And there's some other promises too, that the church would be, believers would be pillars that would never be moved out of the temple and would have a stone with their new name on it. And then going back to the church of Philadelphia, the second to last church mentioned in the letters, Jesus says, these things says the Holy one, the true one having the key of David. So here in revelation, we start to see this emphasis on Jesus, his connection to David, that he's the descendant of David. And that's really important. Another detail that I'll talk about with 24 elders. So the one opening and no one will shut and shutting and no one opens. So Philadelphia is nothing is negative about this church from Christ's perspective. They've been patient. They've endured. I have known your works. Behold, I have set before you a door having been opened, which no one is able to shut it because you have little power and yet have kept my word and have not denied my name. And then, of course, in verse 10. 
because you kept the word of my endurance, I also will keep you from the hour of the trial that is about to come on all the world to try those dwelling on the earth. And then, of course, there's, a, there's another mention of this promise of a garland. Hold on to what you have. Keep your garland. So this is so important. This Think about what comes in the very next chapter. In chapter 4, it opens with a door standing open in heaven. And then John is caught up. He's raptured into heaven through that door. And look what was promised to the Church of Philadelphia, an open door that no one can shut. So you think about the narrative. This is these these things don't stand apart, but they were woven into Revelation because they're connected. They're they're themes that are connected together. That this faithful church, which is overcoming, has an open door from Christ, and they're going to escape before the hour of trial that comes on the whole world. They're going to escape. So they're promised an open door. And they're going to escape before the hour of trial. And then in Revelation 4, right in the very next chapter, after these things, I saw and behold, a door opened in the sky. And the first voice that I heard as of a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you what must come to pass after these things. For me personally, I, I, it's hard not to see the rapture here as a type, at least as a type. You know, did the Apostle John somehow experience what the rapture was going to be? So maybe it was more than a type for him. Maybe he actually, some in some sense, lived it. Could God have transported him through time to understand and experience what it was going to be like in the future? That's possible. It doesn't say that this part is actually a vision. It could be reality for him. I think he, I think it was reality. I think he was transported into heaven through a door. And it wasn't just a trance or something or a dream, but that he really experienced this. But could he have actually been experiencing the rapture? It doesn't say. It's possible. But either way, I think this is clearly a picture of the rapture event. Um, and think about exactly what had just been promised to the Church of Philadelphia, an open door and escaping before the hour of trial. And right here, very next chapter, a door standing open in the sky. And John, at the sound of a trumpet, just like 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, is caught up into heaven. And suddenly before him is a throne. All right. So again, right after the letters to the churches, right after the promises to the churches is this heavenly throne room scene. And around the throne are 24 thrones. So remember, it's the very last promise in the letters to the churches right before chapter four is to sit with Christ on his throne as he sat down with his father on his throne. It's the promise of a throne. We're talking a few verses before here, so you, it's hard to dis, to to divide those things and not see the connection. And sitting on the thrones, I saw twenty four elders. So the word elder, presbyteros, that's exclusively used of human beings in Scripture, um, definitely throughout the New Testament, but I think also in the Greek Old Testament, in the Septuagint translation of the, of the Old Testament. This is a human term. It refers to aged men. And there's actually a, a feminine version of that word referring to like elder women um, that I think is used one time in the New Testament. But this refers to human beings, elders, humans. They're not angels. And in Revelation 7, they're distinguished from angels because they're, they're referred to in the same context. So these elders are not angels. They're a different entity and they're human beings, but they're clearly here glorified and they have thrones, which was just promised to the church. And they have white garments, which was just promised to the church. We're talking just a handful of verses earlier than this. And on their heads, golden garlands. Garlands were promised to the church uh, mentioned several times in the letters, like I, like I said, Greek Stephanos, it's the same word. And golden even, if you recall, Jesus admonished the Laodicean church to buy gold from him. So even gold was one of the things that was promised to the churches that would receive it. Gold, garlands, white garments, thrones. All these things, these were all the things promised to the churches. And 
to sever those promises from the very next chapter, I think is 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 kind of closing your eyes to something that's pretty pretty straightforward in the narrative, as well as the rapture picture, the promise of escape before the hour of trial, before the tribulation period. And then in the next chapter, we see a reference again to David. So if you recall in the letters, Jesus has the key of David. So we see that important reference. And then here, one of the elders says to John, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome to open the scroll and to loose its seal. So this is a, another reference to David. So there's an important thing to, to focus on here is that there's something key to Jesus being the descendant of David in Revelation. It's a theme that we find emphasized. And we see it emphasized here in the throne room scene that he is the ultimate David, the ultimate son of David sitting on the throne and the promise has been fulfilled. And so if you recall from First Chronicles uh, chapters 24 and 25, it was King David himself who established the 24 priestly courses. And then there were 288 musicians for service in the temple, and lots were cast for 24. So in a sense, 24 representatives for the priests and 24 representatives for the musicians. And in both instances, there were way more than just 24 priests and way more than just 24 musicians, but the 24 in each case represented the whole and it's kind of similar you know like in a republic like in the united states for instance we're a country of 330 million people and we elect representatives that represent a huge amount so our population is divvied up in terms of congressmen and senators and different governors and things like we elect them and they go and represent us in theory and that's that's something that you know, you kind of have a, a glimpse of that here. They're not elected, but the elders are representing a much larger group. And so ultimately, we see in verse 9, and I read from the ESV in the last video, but this is the LSV, and we use the best manuscript evidence for uh, these verses. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll. This is the elders singing this and to open its seals because you were slain and you purchased us. Keyword, highlight it, underline it, star it to God in your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue. So that word, you know, that, that means language. So, you know, the tongue in your mouth, but that's the word that they use for language, glossa and people and nation the elders singing this they're singing in about themselves they were the ones redeemed by the blood of the lamb and they're not angels because they're redeemed from the earth from every tribe and tongue these are human beings redeemed from the earth and they're not just jewish and they're not just israelites it's it's the plain teaching of scripture you can't get around the fact that they're redeemed out of every tribe and tongue, and people, and nation. These are a universally brought out group, called out group from the earth, cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so a lot of people want to see the rapture in Revelation 7, where there's a great multitude in white robes from every tribe and language and nation. But they miss that here is a different, a distinct group that is also from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The distinction is that this group actually has the things promised to the churches, whereas the multitude in Revelation 7 does not have the things promised to the churches. The church has promised garlands and gold and thrones and white garments. And authority over the nations and thrones represent kingly power and authority as do crowns. So 
this great multitude represented by 24 is the church which is raptured to heaven through an open door which is promised to you know promised to philadelphia and collectively to all believers who are faithful and overcoming and they're glorified this is the church and then finally the so one last thing i want to talk about was the couple of verses that are often used to attack the pre-tribulation rapture but like i said i don't think they hold up to any kind of scrutiny so in matthew 24 and all of that discourse which i believe is really all about the tribulation period after the rapture i think there may be some hints of the rapture here but overall this is about the the true labor pains that occurred during the tribulation period leading up to the return of christ and if you recall from Isaiah 66, the church is born before the labor pains strike the woman. The woman is Israel. And Jesus says, you know, this is the beginning of labor pains. This is the beginning of sorrows. So these are tribulation events. But in uh, Matthew 24, verse 29, it says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give her light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then will appear the sign of the son of man in the sky. And then will all the tribes of the earth strike the breast and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and much glory. And he will send his messengers with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his chosen from the four winds from the ends of the heavens to the ends thereof. And then of course we have the parable of the fig tree, which, you know, we've talked about that so much as an indicator connected to the reestablishment of Israel and how that generation will not pass away until everything is fulfilled, including this final gathering at the end of the tribulation. So the argument is made that because this is clearly after the tribulation and there's a trumpet and the chosen are gathered, that this must be the rapture. And it disproves a pre-trib rapture. That's that's the argument. And it makes sense on, on the surface. So that's understandable. But it's actually a, it's what's called a straw man argument. So it's basically saying that, you know, the pre-trib camp doesn't account for this because this is, this is you know, this is a post-trib gathering. Well, that's a straw man because the pre-trib argument does account for this. In fact, I don't know any teacher on the pre-trib rapture that, that doesn't agree that there is a gathering after the tribulation. So every side, all the different timings agree with this. And this is not proof against the pre-trib rapture. The pre-trib rapture teaches that there's two. There's the, the pre-tribulational resurrection and rapture of the church into heaven. And then there's the post-tribulation resurrection of the tribulation saints, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And then the gathering of Israel. And I think here the emphasis is not so much even on the tribulation saints, the Gentiles. This is really focused on the elect, the chosen of Israel who are still dispersed, who have not fully been regathered. And um, this fulfills some of the prophecies from the Old Testament about how God would stretch out his hand and regather them again from the nations you know, a second time. So that was maybe partially fulfilled at the reestablishment of Israel in 1948, but not fully. There's still a lot of Israelites out there. He's going to gather them all back together, just as he promised, and bring them back. So notice something really key here. No resurrection is mentioned at all. And I'm not saying there's not a resurrection. I think you know there is in the sense that the tribulation saints will be resurrected, and the Old Testament saints, as mentioned in Daniel 12, uh, will be resurrected at the end, but the emphasis is not on a resurrection. This is a gathering, and so I think this points more to the actual second gathering of the Israelites back to the land, the ones that are still out there. And it's emphasized that you know it's at the sound of a trumpet, so people make the argument that well, that has to be First Thessalonians chapter four and First Corinthians fifteen, but. Uh, that's not really a very good argument because a trumpet is employed in a ton of places prophetically. You hear a trumpet all over the place. So it's using like pretty much the most common sound that's heard announcing judgment, gathering, or dispersion of armies. There's, you know, the gathering of the church is the last trumpet. 
There's seven trumpet judgments in Revelation. There's a trumpet here that's blown to gather the elect. So that's important. And there's some um, pre-tribulation scholars that would say, well, this tribulation spoken of here is actually the present tribulation that we all suffer in the age of the church. But this is not talking about the great tribulation. So they still see this as the pre-trib rapture. I don't agree with that view. I, I That makes sense, but I, I think this really is a post-trib gathering, but it's definitely not the church. This is the elect of Israel. And finally, in Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And the souls of those who have been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus. Remember, Revelation 6, the slain martyrs under the, under the altar, the fifth seal. And because of the word of God, and who did not worship the beast nor his image, and did not receive the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they lived and reigned with the Christ 1,000 years. And the rest of the dead did not live again until the 1,000 years may be completed. This is the first resurrection. So a couple of points here. The first thing is notice that it's emphasized that John saw a group on thrones who had judgment, and they're distinct from the souls that had been beheaded, those that had been overcome. Remember, remember Revelation 13, the beast completely overcomes the saints, and Christ promised that the church will not be overcome. So the church cannot be present in the tribulation because the church will withstand the gates of hell, which is actually in the Greek Hades, not, not Gehenna, not hell, but really Hades. The church cannot be completely overcome, whereas the saints of the tribulation are completely overcome, completely slain, except for the remnant of Israel that's protected in the wilderness. But notice the distinction, those on thrones, that's the elders. That's the only group in all of the of Revelation that is described as sitting on thrones besides God and Christ himself, and judgment was given to them. So if you recall, it's written in the New Testament that we will judge angels. The church will judge angels. And if you recall from last week, Ephesians 2 says that, you know, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So there's something unique about the church where we actually get to sit down, so to speak, with kingly authority and power in our glorification, whereas the tribulation saints in Revelation chapter 7 aren't seated, but they're standing before the throne. And it says that they will serve him in his temple. So they have a different role. They are the children of God, just like the church is the children of God, just like the Israelites that are saved are the children of God. But we don't all have the same role or the same office. And that's an important thing. But in verse four, we see this distinction. Those on thrones, they have judgment. That's the 24 elders, which again, represent the collective church. They're distinct from the, the slain tribulation saints who had been beheaded. And the tribulation saints are all overcome. And they were faithful to the end. They did not take the mark. They did not worship the beast. So they lived and reigned again. So this brings us to probably the, the second most used post-tribulation proof. And that's this final clause. This is the first resurrection. So they would say that, well, this is the first resurrection and this is post-tribulational. So there can't be a pre-tribulational resurrection. And to that, I just say, well, then we're missing something here because that must mean Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And that must mean that Elijah didn't resurrect a person. And then subsequently, Elisha resurrect a person. And that must mean that, you know, Jairus' daughter is still dead and Lazarus is still dead. And that must mean that the two witnesses didn't get resurrected and raptured to heaven. And Tabitha, I believe. And then also there's another resurrection recorded in Acts. Uh, the young man that fell from the window who was resurrected. And then in Matthew 27, it says there were many, were as many holy people or saints came out of their tombs after the resurrection and appeared to many. So there was a some sort of large resurrection around the time of Jesus' death and resurrection itself. 
So there have been many resurrections and they've preceded this one. So to argue that this disproves the rapture just doesn't withstand any kind of scrutiny because it's not the first sequential resurrection at all. It would actually be like the 11th or 12th resurrection in order. And the Greek word here for first really can mean different things. It can mean sequence, that's true, but it can also mean like priority, things like that. So I think the point here is that the post-tribulation resurrection of saints is completed here. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is unto life. And the second resurrection is unto death. In the great white throne judgment, those that are raised up after the millennial period are judged by their deeds. They're not judged by faith. It doesn't say that. It says that they're judged by their works. And that Hades gave up its dead and the sea gave up its dead. And they stand before the Lord. They're judged by their works. The books are opened. And they are cast into the lake of fire with Hades and with death. And that's all done away with. So I think the emphasis here is first resurrection, broadly speaking, are all of those resurrected before the millennial period. They're resurrected unto life. They're saved through faith. And you want to be a part of this resurrection, whether it's the pre-trib rapture, whether it's the post-trib, the left behind saints. You got to be part of one of those groups if you want to have eternal life. So that's all I really wanted to share with you. I know that that was quite a bit, but I hope that encourages you. And I know there's a lot to be looking for. There's several really high watch days coming up. And the Great Conjunction is on 21st. That's coming up next week. And there's so much going on with that. We think that could be a picture of Revelation 12, 4. And then finally, Christmas Day has a lot to be looking at. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, Christmas, that's pagan. That's, you know, and I understand it's become pagan in a lot of ways. But um, I don't think we as believers need to yield anything to the devil. He doesn't have rights over one of the days of the year. Not Halloween, not the winter solstice, and not Christmas Day. Those days belong to the Lord. And if he wants to have the church taken to heaven on Christmas Day as a testimony to the world, then he can do it. That's his right because he owns the day. The devil doesn't own the day. It belongs to the Lord. It belongs to us. So that could be. It could be that there's been so much emphasis from the church on Christmas because maybe we're going to go home on Christmas or around that time. But we're certainly getting very close. And I love you all, brothers and sisters. If you don't know the Lord, please. Please, now is the time. There's no more time left. Believe in him. He died for your sins, past, present, and future. And if you would accept him and believe in him, then his spirit will come and reside within you as a permanent seal. You will be his child. You're literally adopted into the family of God through faith alone. And then... As an 11th hour worker, just be faithful with whatever God gives you. Maybe you need to tell one person, you know, someone in your family or something or a close friend. You could just say that, hey, I just came to faith. Or maybe you could share on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or something, share a meme of the gospel. There's, I mean, there's so many simple things that you can do that take no effort at all. And you could win someone to the Lord. So the internet in a lot of ways is the end of the age net that has been cast and is gathering a lot of fish and a lot of lost coins. And you can be part of that. So I would just encourage you with that. But the Lord is coming soon and keep looking up. Maranatha.